My name is Joel Renner, and I want to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment on this video as you watch it so more people can see this teaching. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner, and I've been waiting for you. Today is the last in my series called The Supernatural Supply of the Holy Spirit. And today I'm going to begin with another story. I want to talk to you about worry. When I was a young man, I was literally eaten up with worry. And you know why? Because I got it from my church when I was a young boy. It wasn't their fault. It was just my perception of something that I heard very often in, in our church. I often heard, are you burdened for souls? Are you carrying a burden in prayer? Are you carrying this kind of burden? Are you carrying that kind of burden? It wasn't my pastor's fault or anybody else's fault. But in my little mind, I began to perceive that if I was really a serious Christian, then I needed to be burdened about something all the time. And even from the time that I was young, I always felt heavy and burdened and serious. And eventually in life, it became worry. And I worried about everything. I can remember in high school being so worried about what people would think of me, saying to the Lord, God, am I supposed to worry like this? But I felt like maybe it meant that I was serious. Maybe this was right. Maybe this is the way that a serious Christian should be. You should be burdened. You should be concerned. You should be worried. I was just worried all the time. And then when I went to college, oh, just worry ate me up. When Denise and I first got married and went on our honeymoon, I was so consumed with worry and fret and anxiety that we would have to stop and pray together. And then in the early years of our marriage, worry ate me up so much that I ended up with a bleeding ulcer in the hospital, receiving bags of blood, blood transfusions, because I was losing so much blood by worrying. And guess what happened? When I was receiving that blood transfusion, it was in the early, early, early 80s. And right while that blood was pouring into my arms, I was watching the news in the hospital. And the news announced there was a new disease that had just been detected. They didn't have a name for it yet, but they now knew that it was being transmitted through the blood banks in the United States. And people who received a blood transfusion were at risk of this new disease. And I remember looking at the blood flowing into my arm thinking, I probably have the disease, and I worried and worried and worried and worried that I had just got this killer disease, which later came to be called AIDS. I was so consumed with worry that I went to the local doctor to have a blood test. I went to have a blood test to see if I had AIDS. And finally, the doctor came back and said, Mr. Renner, you're clear, you have no AIDS, you're free of this disease, but I need to tell you that 70% of these tests are not reliable. 70%, I walked out of the office worried. And then as I walked past the receptionist desk who knew me because she attended our church, she said, Mr. Renner, it's been good to see you. Glad you came in for that AIDS test. And then I worried that other people would hear that and they would wonder why I was having an AIDS test. It didn't matter what it was, I worried about it. I was just eaten up with worry all the time until I had to have a blood transfusion because I was losing blood from an ulcer which was created in me by non-stop worry just eaten up by it. I even worried about if I was really saved. Oh, I really questioned my salvation. I prayed and prayed and prayed, Jesus, in case I'm not saved, please save me again. Lord, if I didn't really mean it ever at any previous moment in my life, Lord, I mean it sincerely right now. I just worried about everything, fretted about everything all the time. I literally lived in a state of worry. And what was really bad is I thought that that's the way that responsible Christians should live. They should always be burdened, heavy, should always be concerned about something. And one day I fell on my knees in a church auditorium. I said, Lord, I'm finished with this. I cannot live like this. I'm bleeding. I'm eaten up. I cannot enjoy my marriage and my new wife. I can't enjoy anything in life. I literally could not go but a couple hours 
before I would have one of these episodes of intense worry. And I said, Lord, I'm finished with this. I'm not changing anything with my worry. I'm done with it. And there was one scripture I really didn't like in those days. And it was in Philippians chapter 4 where the Bible tells us not to worry about anything. I didn't like that verse because I didn't know how to do it. Maybe you are a person who tends to worry. When you read the Bible and it says, don't be concerned, don't be worried, how do you deal with that verse? I didn't deal very well with it because I didn't know how to do it. So when I read Philippians chapter 4, I would just skip over that verse because I didn't know what to do with that verse. But that day when I fell on my knees and I said, Jesus, you've got to do something for me, I received a supernatural supply, a brand new touch. Jesus, my great benefactor, stepped forward and he made a marvelous contribution of the Holy Spirit into my life that totally permanently liberated me from worry, fret, anxiety, and concern. And from that time to this day, it has been years and years and years and years and years, I have been liberated from worry. I am not a man that is given to worry. I'm just not. I made a decision that I was no longer going to walk that way, and I received a supernatural supply of the Holy Spirit that changed the way that I look at life. If you're a person given to worry today, I'm going to talk to you about a supernatural supply of the Spirit that will set you free. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. Today I'm going to talk to you about a new supernatural supply of the Holy Spirit that will set you free from worry. You do not have to live in a constant state of worry, fret, and anxiety. If you'll just receive a new touch of the Spirit, it will change your perspective and totally set you free. That is my personal testimony. And I want you to have my series called The Supernatural Supply of the Holy Spirit. My friends, there is a river of power waiting for you, a river of joy. When the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Philippians, he was in a Roman prison. And from that horrible, horrible place, he wrote about joy almost 20 times in the book of Philippians. If he can have joy where he is, you can have joy where you are. There's a river of joy waiting for you, but it comes in a new supply of the Holy Spirit. And that's what this series is about. It will really help you. I really want you to have this because I believe that you need it. And it comes with a study guide. My friends, the study guides are so wonderful. You know, if you go to our website, our website is loaded with so many different study guides. They're good for personal Bible study. They're good for home groups. They are awesome for Sunday school. It is loaded with Greek words, history, points, principles from the scripture. All of it is in this. I lay it out before you like a banquet. So please order the study guide as well, the supernatural supply of the Holy Spirit. And we're offering you today, and today is the last day, my book's called Sparkling Gems from the Greek, Volume 1, and Sparkling Gems from the Greek, Volume 2. You may say, well, I already have Volume 1. Do you have Volume 2? If you have neither, it really doesn't matter which one you start with. They're both awesome. They're both similar, but what is different is each one of these books contains one thousand Greek word studies, a thousand in this one, a thousand in this one. It is like a lavish meal that is just set in front of you, but it's not written in a complicated way. It's very simple for you to consume. It's a daily devotional. You just read a little bit every day. Every day, I take you below the surface of the scripture. We dig deep and begin to mine sparkling gems from the Greek so that you can see things that your eyes normally would not see. And at the very end of every one of these devotionals, there are questions for you to answer. There's a prayer for you to pray. There's a confession for you to make. This will strengthen your spiritual life. Again, there's volume one and there's volume two. And I want to encourage you to order yours today. And if you're a partner, thank you so much. You are making a difference in somebody else's life. There's someone out there right now who's listening to me, They've got their Bible open. They're getting ready to take notes because you as a partner sent your monthly financial contribution, which enables us to take this program to the ends of the earth. 
It's so amazing that right from the privacy of your home, without ever walking out the door of your house, you can be a missionary. When you go online and become a partner or call us to become a partner or when you send your monthly contribution, it's like you're doing mission work. You're sending the teaching of the Bible to people who are crying out for it. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus commanded every single believer, go into all the world and teach all nations. That is a command, not to some, not to a select few, to every single believer. You might say, well, I don't know how to go into all the world and teach all nations. Well, I'm telling you how. Become a partner with us. And when you give to our ministry, it is the equivalent of you going on a mission trip every single month. You know, if really, if you went on a big mission trip, it would cost you a lot of money all at one time. But when you become a partner, you do mission work every month with a small amount or whatever God puts on your heart. It's easier to bite off and to chew and to do. And you go on a mission trip every month. Wow, it's amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And when you become a partner, we immediately send you my book, Life in the Combat Zone, because it is dedicated to partners. And we send you Denise's little book, but powerful book called The Gift of Forgiveness. And remember that if you need prayer, please call us. Call us right now. Right now, somebody's waiting for you. Or send us an email. And the moment your email shows up in the inbox, we're really going to begin to pray for you. But today... I'm going to talk to you about a new supply of the Holy Spirit that will set you free from worry. And I've got my Bible. I hope you have yours. Let's return to Philippians chapter 1, verse 19, which is our anchor verse this week. And in Philippians 1, verse 19, Paul says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul was in prison. But Paul says, here's what I know. He says, for I know. The Greek word oida. I really, really know this. He's speaking very confidently. I know that this, the word this is the Greek word tauto. It points to his predicament being in prison. I know that this situation that I'm in shall turn to my salvation. Shall turn is a Greek word apobino, which literally means to step away, to walk out, to disembark. Paul says, I'm going to step away from this place. This is not my end. I'm walking out of here. Well, believe me, that was against the odds because people did not walk away from Roman prisons. But Paul says, not me. I know my end. I'm not going to get stuck here. I know, I emphatically know that this situation that I'm in is not the end. I'm going to walk out. In fact, it's going to result in my salvation. The word salvation here, the Greek word soterion, this word soterion here describes salvation or deliverance or safety. Paul says, I'm getting out of this place. I'm going to be rescued. I'm going to be delivered from this place. Why was he so confident? He tells us through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. The word prayer, the Greek word diasis, which means a concrete petition. He has heard the Philippians are concretely praying and making a petition to God for his release. And now he's banking on it. They're praying for him. So he knows it's going to happen. And he says, and because of the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ and that word supply. I remember the first time I studied this word supply. It nearly overwhelmed me. It's so powerful. It's a Greek word, epikoregia. Epi means on behalf of. The word choregia is where you get the word for a choir or a choreography. It was a big musical production. When you put the two words together, it describes a gift given on behalf of a choir or a big choreographical production. What in the world does that mean? And why is it translated supply? Well, you've got to go back to where the word comes from, and it's only used one other time outside the New Testament. So when Paul used this word, he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was saying. And in history, there was a big choir ready to put on a big production, dancers, musicians, singers. They had trained and trained and trained and trained. It was just time for the show to go on the road. When the director came and said, guys, we're out of money. Pack your bags, go home. I'm sorry but the show is finished. They were despondent because they were so excited. They had given so much and their anticipation was so high and now the show was finished. But a wealthy man heard about it. And when he heard how they trained, when he heard how they prepared, when he heard how sad they were, 
He said, I can fix this. And the wealthy man came and gave a big gift, a big financial contribution on behalf of the choir. That's where this word supply comes from, epikoregia. Here it is translated supply. He gave an enormous supply, a lavish supply, something so magnificent they didn't even know how to spend it all. But when they received his contribution, the show was on the road again. They were empowered to perform. And now Paul says to the Philippians and to us, hey guys, I'm coming out of this prison. I'm walking out of here. This is going to result in my deliverance. I know it, number one, because you're petitioning God for me. And number two, because Jesus Christ is my wealthy benefactor. And he has just made to me a new contribution of the Holy Spirit that is massive. It is lavish. It has empowered me. The curtains are open again. This show is on the road. Paul was empowered by a new supply of the Holy Spirit. And that's what will happen to you if you receive a new supply. Call us right now. We'll pray for you to receive it. But when you come to Philippians 4, 6, we find that when you receive a new supply of the Holy Spirit, it sets you free from fear. Look what the Bible says in Philippians 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing. That word careful means do not worry. Do not fret. Do not be anxious. That's the verse I struggled with when I was a younger man because I worried about everything. And what really bothered me about this verse is it says, be careful for nothing. The word nothing, the Greek word maiden, it means absolutely nothing at all. And if you were going to really translate this correctly, it means don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything at all. I didn't know how to do that. I did not know how to do that. But Paul goes on to say, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Paul says in everything, the word everything is the word panta, the word pan is all encompassing. It's everything. The word ta refers to a minute detail. Together it's panta in everything and everything and every little detail, even in the most minuscule details of your life in everything, which means it is all right to pray about everything. We're commanded in this verse to pray about everything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. But I want you to look at this word supplication. The word supplication is a Greek word deasis. That is so profoundly important because the word deasis describes specific prayer. This is not general prayer. God bless me. God help me. It is specific prayer. God bless me like this. God, I need you to help me like this. God, I need you to do this. It is the word deasis. Very, very specific prayer. A request for a specific need to be met. And the word deasis usually described a physical or a material need. It was a petition. Just as if you were to write a wealthy person and present them a petition. You were to present to them a request. Would you please do this? A wealthy person is going to say, well, I'm happy to help you, but I want to understand what you need. You have to list it out concretely. That's the word that is used here. And now Paul says, when you pray, don't speak in generalities. Get very specific when you pray in everything with prayer and supplication. Yes, very concrete, specific requests. He says, let your requests be made known unto God. Now he adds the word request. What's the difference between a supplication and a request? Well, the word request is a Greek word, aiteo. Oh, this word is strong. The word aiteo means to beseech, to petition, or even to demand. It really means to demand, to be adamant in requesting assistance to meet a tangible need such as food, shelter, money, or other physical needs. It means to firmly request that a need be met and to ask with a full expectation that you're going to receive what is being firmly requested. So it means when you come before the presence of God, You can't waver. You can't say, well, I don't know if God's really going to do this, or I don't know if I should really ask. You have to request it. The Greek word, aiteo, you have to be firm in your request, and you have to understand that you're a child of God. 
You have a right to ask. Now you might say, well, I don't want to be arrogant when I pray. You don't have to be arrogant, but you can be bold. There's a difference between arrogance and boldness and confidence. Boldness and confidence is what you ought to have when you come into the presence of God. And if you're making your request based on the Bible, you have no reason to be ashamed. In fact, we're told in 1 John chapter 5, you can be very bold, you can be very confident that if you ask according to the will of God, it will be done for you. You can come before God and say, God, I'm asking you on the basis of your promise. And we know from the word supplication, we need to get specific. It needs to be a very specific request. In fact, it says, let your request be made known unto God. No guesswork here. Made known. The Greek word, which literally means vividly known, clearly described, clearly understood. God wants you to be clear when you talk to him. And I want to ask you, if you were God, would you understand your prayers? Are you clear in what you say to God? God wants you to be very clear, vivid when you speak to him. And listen to verse 7. This is the verse that is just amazing. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The word peace, the Greek word arene, it really describes order in the place of chaos. It depicts a calm inner stability that results in the ability of one to conduct himself peacefully even in the midst of circumstances that would normally be traumatic or upsetting. This word peace is the Greek equivalent of the word shalom. The word shalom expresses the ideas of wholeness, completeness, tranquility in the soul that is unaffected by outward circumstances or pressures. That's what God wants you to have. It is so different from worry, fret, and anxiety. God wants you to be tranquil, never worried. He wants you to have peace in the place of chaos, unaffected. That's really what the word peace means. In fact, this verse says it passes all understanding. The word passes, the Greek word, hupereko, it describes something that is superior, something that is excelling. The word understanding is the Greek word noon. It describes the mind. This exceeds the mind. It is beyond anything the mind can understand. It is a peace. It is a tranquility. It is an inner stability that is just amazing. It transcends the mind. In fact, the Bible says it will even keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And guess what the word keep is? The word keep here is really wonderful. In every ancient city, there was a big gate at the entrance to the city. And outside that gate, there were two soldiers. The two soldiers had the right to say who would be admitted and who would be stopped. If they gave you admittance, then those soldiers would move out of the way and they would let you come into the city. But if those two soldiers felt you were bad for the city, they would put forth their spears and their shields and they would block you so you could not come into the city. And now Paul uses this very same word, which means when the peace of God is ruling in our hearts, it stands at the entrance of our hearts. And the word hearts here is the Greek word cardia, which describes the inner self. It can even describe your emotions. The peace of God stands at the door of our heart, of our emotions, of our inner self. And the peace of God is a guard. And if something is good for us, the peace of God will make entrance for that thing to enter our life. But if something is foul, something is evil, something's going to mess us up on the inside, this peace of God, like a guard, will block its entrance. So that worry, that fret, that anxiety, or that evil force cannot find access to you. That is just amazing. That's why the verse says it will keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Wow. Well, I lived in a state of fret and worry until God touched me that day when I was on my knees at an altar. He gave me a new supernatural supply of the Holy Spirit and suddenly that worry and anxiety began to break off of me. And from that time to this day, I have never lived in a state of worry and anxiety. It just is not who I am. In fact, sometimes people say, are you not worried? No, I don't do that. God changed me decades ago. I just don't do that. I received a supernatural supply that set me free from that. And today, the peace of God stands at the door of my heart 
and it blocks all that from finding entrance to me. And that's what can happen to you when you receive a new supply of the Holy Spirit. I'll be back in just a moment. I'm going to pray for you. Would you like to tap into a nonstop flow of supernatural joy? In the supernatural supply of the Holy Spirit, you'll learn how the Apostle Paul had joy even when locked up in one of Rome's most miserable prisons. If Paul could have joy where he was, you can have it where you are too. You just need to know how to receive it. In this five-part series, you'll learn what the supernatural supply of the Holy Spirit is, how to forget your past and focus on your future, the key to the peace of God ruling your heart and emotions. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $10, this series will show you how to take the leap into a vast reservoir of supernatural joy. In addition to this teaching series, you can also get the book Sparkling Gems from the Greek Volumes 1 and 2. In these books, Rick unlocks brilliant treasures within God's Word and shows you how to live an intimate, uncompromising life with God. In an easy-to-read devotional format, each volume of Sparkling Gems explores more than 1,000 in-depth Greek word studies that are sure to inspire and provoke you to plunge deeper into what God has for your life. Don't delay ordering your copy today. Sparkling Gems 1 for just $40 and Sparkling Gems 2 for only $45. Don't miss these powerful teachings, the supernatural supply of the Holy Spirit, and sparkling gems from the Greek, Volume 1 or 2. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org. Call or go online now. Jesus wants to set you free from worry. And I'm going to pray for you in just a moment that you will be set free. But I want you to order my series called The Supernatural Supply of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, my friend, when you receive a new supply of the Holy Spirit, everything changes in your life. You can receive one right now. And I want you to get the series because when you hear it and hear it and hear it, it will keep you refilled with the Holy Spirit. And it comes with a great study guide. We're also offering you my books Sparkling Gems from the Greek, number one, and Sparkling Gems from the Greek, number two. These books are just treasures. You will love them. You will cherish them for years and years to come. But let me pray for you. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that we do not have to live in a state of worry that just eats us alive. My friend, I speak freedom to you in Jesus' name. I tell you to go free from that. Just open your arms right now. Say, Lord, I need a new supply of the Holy Spirit to change my perspective. Jesus, I ask you to step forward right now as our great spiritual benefactor. And Lord, I ask you to give a new supply of the Holy Spirit to my friend right now to change them permanently. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is our last program this week on the subject of a new supply of the Holy Spirit. It's been so good to be with you. And I could hardly wait to we're back together again in a few days. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is power. Wow, wasn't that a great teaching? My friends, I want to ask you to please like, subscribe, and comment on that video you just watched so more people can see it.